Maranan Rabanan, Shiva Shlita, all the Gedali Yisrael gathered here, Talmidei Chachamim, and supporters of the Yeshiva, Talmidei Yeshiva. I'm uncomfortable. I was asked to represent the Tzibur, all the Talmidim, Klal Yisrael, in expressing Akara Satoiv, may Oimek Libenu, but this high Gavra, Rabbi Vayakira, Yedid Nafshi, Reb Shloime Yehuda Shlita. I really feel uncomfortable not being a Talmud of the Yeshiva, but I thought it over and decided that maybe I am a Shtikl Mechutten to the Yeshiva. It's now this year, 90 years, when my father, Zechat Tzadik Levracha, came to learn in the Yeshiva. It's about 94 years this summer when my mother, Allah Shalom's family, my grandparents, moved from Grodna to the Mir so my Zayda, Zechat Tzadik Levracha, could learn by the Mashgiach of Yeruchim, Zechayna Levracha. So maybe I have enough mirror credentials to stand here mitzad the makire atayv. There's so much akaras atayv that's due to Reb Shloimeh Yehuda. Abgeret the koyach atayre which he was marbe, bein agluyim and bein anestorois. The gluyos. The thousands and thousands and thousands of the Avrechim, the Neitzian Am Yekarim Am Asulayim in Paz, that learned Torah Lishma Metoich Atchak in Yerushalayim, Yer Akoydesh, in the Yeshiva. That's the Amud that Torah, the Dereinu, we're holding now in the Yemei Evloi of the Sarah Torah. What a hollow. But these Avrechim, these future G'doylim, present G'doylim, and it's all in Ein Kemach, Ein Torah, the general, to galvanize Klal Yisrael, to appreciate what Torah does for the world. The Amud Torah, Al Torah, the Welt State of Torah. Reb Shleim Yehuda has taught that. Achzokah Satoira has become what we call in vogue because of him. So many, so many people that are Matzliach and Parnasa can't command respect by their peers unless they step up to the plate. The Achzokah Satoira in a dramatic way. Bain in Eretz Yisrael, Bain in America. It has become almost a criteria to be considered a Chosh of the Balabas. And, the, and the, the, the one who made this revolution came out single-handedly by using himself as an example and by begging and beseeching. Gets a cook. There's no better way to, to spend your money. There's no better way to give back a toidol Hashem for what he gave you than to be machzike a Torah. To be machzike a Torah in the fullest sense of the world. And for that, Reb Shleim Yehuda, on behalf of everyone gathered here and on behalf of the Ganze Oilam a Torah, Yashikoyach, Yashikoyach, Zol did the Ebesh Tzirik Tzolem, Miyado yam leyo absucha agdoisha darachava. Nachas from your children. Gesund. Varius gufa noiris noira maalio. Lo oirich yamim vishonim toivos. One has to understand. From vanantas men zoichet to them. What is the secret that a Kodesh Baruchu in such a public way? entrusted you with this trust. And the story is Lashem and I really am a Yedid Nefesh that we go back 
over four decades, Rabbi Foyle became frag in the Zell Bazaar. The Emerson is Loi Heim Tchila Sagdusha. The families from which they come, Lefkowitz is a Yedid Nefesh, a Rabbi Shlomo Yehuda's parents. And always years ago, I heard what Atzile bin Yisrael, what Toyu Dikiyid his father is, what a Talmud Chacham. I had this chus to be a Talmud, the first shear by his Moiri Chamav, Zechet Sadik Levrocha, the Rashiv of Toyu Das, the Chaim Yisrael, Belsky Zechet Sadik Levrocha, who we such a Chosnei Kibbenoi. That Torah, in the Avois, who heard the Baskol Yoytze Mahar Choyrev, Oilohem Lebriyus Mel Boynesh Al Torah, they heard of Shimeyim Ben Yechoyis calling in the Gemara and Brachis, Torah Matei Aleho, and they became G'doyle Torah, Tamid Chachamim, through that calling. Shleimi Yod, Yehuda, for those who know him, know that he's a emissa Talmud Chacham. Quite a few hours a day, he dedicates to learning the Iyun, to be Maimik and be Machadish. With that, with that Kavata Itim La Torah, he has that same burn, that same drive. Torah Matei Aleho. Torah Matei Aleho. You have, you feel that. Everybody that feels that has the ability to respond to that. He's responded and he'll continue to respond and be a trailblazer for a door, for a door that's blessed with resources from the Rebbein Shalaylam of wealth, Bar Hashem. He's the one who's teaching us. He's a Rebbe in Klal Yisrael. And for that, on behalf of everyone, I'm a shlucha to Ravonon to say thank you. So long Thank you, thank you. I have some good news and some bad news. <clears throat> the bad news is unfortunately due to COVID hitting the nursing industry in a substantial way. I'm not sure how much I'll be able to help the yeshiva financially uh, this year. The good news is I just turned 50. In Pirkei Ovis, says, in Hamishim Leitz, so I hereby commit to the mirror that I will make myself available to offer them all innumerable amount of Eitzes on all topics and subjects. However,
However, since I do get busy and can't always respond promptly, I'm making this pledge over three years. Since, my, since we got married, my wife tells me once in a while, I talk in my sleep. And she told me uh, just two nights ago, she says, you were saying over your drush and mirror, for mirror. I said, I don't talk in my sleep. Yeah, you do. I said, really? So tell me the drush. She says, how was I supposed to understand it? You didn't have your teleprompter. Firstly, I mean this seriously, I need to mention the over 100 younger chevra who have dedicated themselves to spend night after night raising funds for the yeshiva. When, when watching a video of their meetings, they were referred to as the young alumni. I'm serious when I say I mekana every one of them for the work that they're doing with Shem Shemai, for the good of Tyra. But I'm slightly disheartened that I'm considered to be too old for this. I don't know who made the regulations, but I'm sure besides myself, there are many others who would want to be part of this Hebra as well. My plan was two years ago, Sukkot, to speak about Mashkiach, the Baron Chodrasatel, who I had a very special relationship with. We were extremely close. And a lot of you know I've, I've spoken beforehand about things that he did for me. I thought I was leaving a yeshiva with 180 boys in New York, coming to a place with a thousand people. I'm free. But that wasn't the case. Rebarn, for some reason, took a, uh, an interest in me, and every time I asked him why, he just swiped his hand, like, what are you talking about? I heard approximately three years ago that he wasn't, uh, he wasn't well, he was in the hospital, so I got on a plane and I came. And I said to him, do me a favor. Can you please tell me why did you pick me out? And I, obviously afterwards I found out that everybody had a shaykhus with their bar. But the shaykhis I had was life-altering. I think that I wanted to speak about him on Sukkot two years ago, but the unexpected changed those plans. Uh, and I've spoken already many times on the impact that he had on my life. I've watched and I've listened to many a spade him on him to the point where I believe that it's Kalamais of Gereya. However, I'd like to share with you two personal stories that I've never said over that show the wide spectrum 
of my Kesher with him. When I was a Bokhar in Yeshiva, I had already been there a little over a year. My father decided to come surprise me and visit me. Take note, parents, don't do that because it doesn't always work out the way uh, you want it to. And the problem actually was, I can't remember what I think it was because I was learning all night, but it was 11 o'clock in the morning and I was, uh, during my REM sleep in Madeira. So my father asked Mashkiach, could you help me find Shlom Yehuda? So I, he says, Mashkiach said, I just I saw me as a snushim. Mashkiach then sprinted over to my Madeira. He said, your father's here. Get out of bed, get dressed, and get over there. I never got dressed so fast. I was in yeshiva literally within four minutes. And my father actually said that he was scared that if he would surprise me and I wouldn't be in yeshiva, it would have been terrible. I chuckled. After Meyer that night, I approached Mashkiach to thank him. He looked at me with the most stern and serious look and said, don't thank me. I didn't do anything for you. I did it 100% for your father so he wouldn't have Agnes Nefesh. But he continued, rest assured, I'll never do it again. I was speechless. As most things that he did for me throughout my seven years in yeshiva, I still didn't understand why. I couldn't think of a reason. I was a buffer, I didn't have money. Why he took that interest in me. To go to the other side of the spectrum, he came to the first time he ever left Eretz Yisrael. The first time he was on an airplane was when he came to America, to Los Angeles, uh, for the Eifruf, and then to New York for my chasa. So when he was in LA for the Eifruf, I figured uh, I'm gonna go get a top class breakfast for him. Now you need to realize when I learned in Eretz Yisrael, they didn't have any bagels. They had something called a bagel, but it was just a challah with a hole. I, however, was one of the few in the know of a bakery across the street from Brisk, which they refer to as the Bells of Bakery. They made real American bagels. So I came home, back home that morning with a tray of bagels, an assortment of cheeses, blocks, donuts, danishes. And I explained to him how we do this in America. I sliced open the bagel for him, smeared cream cheese right before I placed the locks. Now that he had mastered it, I was able to leave and attend to my regular schedule. When I came downstairs 20 minutes later, I could not stop laughing as his Asia's Chayel Hasid Allah Shalom had sliced open the donuts while proceeding to make another bagel and log sandwich. Rishus the Rosh HaYeshiva, Rablaze Yudolf, Finkelsli to the Rosh HaYeshiva Rabbanim, Limdei Teira, Vitim Chel. First of all, before I forget, I would like to ask a teva from everybody. Um, if in their tefillahs they can keep in mind 
a member of my family, my mother, who needs a Yeshua. I don't know how I would be able to repay you, but I would really appreciate it. Her name is Liva Dvayer Basrifka. The way I remember it is Lidaber, to speak. And that's how I remember Liba Dvayer Basrifka. I don't believe that anybody here would disagree that the world as we know it has gone awry. At this point, nothing can happen that would shock us. BLM defiling historical figures and leaders, people who are historically revered are now suddenly despised, stores being looted on an hourly basis while the police just stood there and watched. We are clearly in the time of Iqnis Adi Mashiqa, where the Gemara in Sanhedrin described a time where chutzpah yaska, the chutzpah will grow exponentially. Pneador ki which is understood as leaders or the proverbial dog looking intermittently behind them and deciding in place of what's wrong and right what they need to do just to get reelected. While that's typically the definition of a politician, what stands out is how blatant and shameless they currently overtly behave. Anything and I mean anything goes. A person can wake up in the morning and decide if he's going to be a man or a woman that day. When Donald Trump was elected president, the liberal left whose calling and life's goal was to quote unquote live and let live, suddenly were openly protesting to the point of mayhem and even violence. So not like them, to which I, co I coined a phrase that the left is tolerant of everything except intolerance. And as far as they were concerned, Donald Trump was exhibit A of intolerance. But as history has an interesting way and tends of repeating itself, all mob-induced chaos and anarchy will be blamed on the Jew who will suffer the ultimate collateral fallout. When calculating the world population, the Jews, both religious and irreligious, constitute 0.019% of society, which could be more clearly understood by imagining that theoretically, if the Jewish population grew fivefold, another five Israels, another five Lakewoods, another five tri states, another five Europe's, while every other crevice on the globe, the Jewish population also grew fivefold, which is practically even impossible to imagine. <clears throat> Only then would we constitute just 1% of the population. First of all, as a side note, do we ever think, when we say, do we ever think how lucky we are that there are so few Yidin in the whole population and every one of us was chosen? We, we won the lottery, every one of us. But it leads us to the old age question of what causes anti-Semitism. My prediction, and you heard it here first, is that in 15 years, a minimum of 75% of us will be living in Eretz Israel. If you can't feel the undercurrent of anti-Semitism and the hatred that is closely reaching the boiling point, you're clearly living under a rock. Not a week goes by without physical attacks, 
sometimes even leading to fatalities. My grandparents, who Baruch Hashem survived the war, were asked numerous times by me and my, sim my siblings, why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you just get out of there? To which we always received the same answer. It didn't happen like the switch of a light bulb. It grew slowly, in baby steps. As a matter of fact, even during the famous Kristallnacht, Goebel, Goebbels asked Hitler Yamashimam what they should do about the Polish peasants burning the shuls. Hitler respond, responded, do not do it. On one hand, but on the other hand, don't stop the people who are doing it from doing it. My grandparents continued, nobody ever believed that something like this could ever happen. Since the destruction of the sec second base of Migdush, and up until after the Holocaust, there was never 20 years that did not have either pogroms, crusades, inquisitions, mass killings, restrictions on Jewish businesses, and of course, the consistent implementation of ghettos. However, America, the Medina Shel Chesed, have let the Jews live at equal footing and equal rights for close to 80 years. Terrorists flourishing beyond anybody's imagination. That same Torah that the Shmira and the Megan consistently defending us. It's been so good for so long that the horrific stories and real life of the old can now only be found in books. The Kedoshim and even the vast majority of the Sheres HaPleta are no longer with us. If you think about it, it wasn't that long ago that more than half of the United States citizens voted a religious Jew, Joe Lieberman, just one bullet away from the presidency. And from there, unfortunately, the tra trajectory gets worse every year. Now, technically, we can give a separate answer for every adverse attack on the Jewish nation. But as the Gemara says in Baba Kama, that they just learned in Yeshiva, when one shark gores three separate and distinct animals, whether the shark, we don't look at what his ethnicity is, how old he is, what gender he is, he's a muad lakoil which means we'll always find another reason to go after another animal. These are three distinct animals, technically allowing you to give an alternate reason for each one. But it comes to a point when we're for forced to believe that even though each adverse anti-Jewish occurrence can be explained with various reasons, we must finally realize that the attacks are actually and truly coming from one reason. <clears throat> As the Gemara says, But the Torah doesn't leave us without an answer of what causes anti-Semitism. As the Gemara in Shabbos states, that from Har Sinai, when we became the Amanivchar, the chosen people, from there, Yardu Asina, Luma Sailam, ever since then, the Goyim hated us. They had a kinna for us. But while that may be the reason and time that it started, I can assure you that no anti Semite can tell you that he hates the Jews because they received the Torah at Har Sinai. I received an answer approximately six years ago when I went to visit Block 3, 4 in Auschwitz. 
which was not one of the blocks that you were supposed to go to. And we had the deputy director open it on a pledge, which is the only pledge I never fulfilled. The conversation was recorded by video. Hanani Kramer has it, I have it. We keep postponing the date. I'd like to put it out because there's some very interesting footage. The way I posed the question was as follows. So obviously the reason he's doing this job is because he, among many Germans, believed that the Holocaust was a travesty, that a vast majority of them cannot get past till today. But you mentioned to me that your father was part of the Nazi youth. We have a saying in the Talmud that a son is very similar to his own father, which leads me to assume that your father did not participate in these horrific actions either. But there's no doubt for the Germans to assure themselves that this would never happen again. There must have been open discussions. So I continued and I said, can you tell me the general consensus of what drove that anti-Semitism? He explained to me that all religions attempt to missionize and attract people to their respective religions. They're very welcoming. Some are more aggressive than others, whereas the Jewish nation is not only uninterested in missionizing, but to the contrary. If a guy wants to convert to Judaism, they're denied, at least for some time. Nobody likes elitists. But the Jew will show his superiority over all other nations by not letting other people into their club. Elitism never fails to lead to kinna, to jealousy. So they put them in ghettos and said, well, how superior do you feel now? And despite the suffering of the Jews, they were still unwelcoming to have people join their group. So they started killing Jews in mass, believing that would lower their morale. And whether it was a pogrom, a crusade, or an inquisition, in horrible suffering, the Jewish nation did not give in. Now we sitting here know, in fact, that we were superior to the other nations, for we and only we received the Torah, because we're a Goy Kaddish and a Mamlechus Kayanim. Our purpose is to be a light unto other nations. But as you can imagine, no guy would change his feelings or opinions based on that notion, and if anything, would take their sin to higher levels. Throughout the history, we've made that grave mistake of believing that assimilating with them, dressing like them, talking like them, attempting to make ourselves unnoticeable, this philosophy has never worked. The Torah in Parshas Vayishlach says, retelling the story of Yaakov meeting Esav with 400 soldiers, and Esav approached him and kissed him. Yaakov obviously knew that this kiss, albeit by his twin brother, wasn't genuine. The vast majority of people in this room have friends who are Goyim. In some cases, their families may be close to each other. Their friendly relationships have gone on for many years and all is good. But when the rubber hits the road, only then do we realize that they are not our brothers. Rashi Ifen Art explains, and I quote, Halacha hi biyadua. Chase of Sinus Yaakov. I really never understood the Rashi for multiple reasons. First of all, what's the halacha? What would be a nafkamina? Secondly, it seems like the halacha is for Esav, Esav Sinus Yaakov. Is that the eighth mitzvah? 
So as far as the first question about halacha, I saw Moshe Feinstein offers an explanation. Just as halacha will be lost in love, so too the sin of the ace of Hasriyaki will also go on and will never cease. But the question still remains. The second question still remains. And I thought Lamia's deity that perhaps we're learning the Rashi incorrectly. I believe we might be placing the punctuation in the wrong place. The way Rashi should be read is Halocha hi biyadua. The halocha is in knowing, despite the chum relationships, despite doing business with each other for years. We can lose ourselves in our belief that our relationship with Asaph is in genuine nature. Zatrashi, <clears throat> that the halacha is Asaph saying is Yahweh. I'm sorry, the halacha is biyadua. The halacha is in knowing and never forgetting. We can never forget, despite how they treat us, that that's going to stay forever. And we have a mitzvah, a halacha, be a dua in knowing. There's no love lost. I've been extremely busy uh, for the last few weeks, maybe getting two hours a night of sleep, dealing with the corona in nursing home facilities. Can you turn off the teleprompter? It's just... Sir, thank you. I don't have the kayak to say his speech. I, may, I just want to share a few machshavas. There's a second type of anti-Semitism. And that anti-Semitism is when Eden hate other Eden. There's a law in the Torah, Sisna is a chichabil you can't hate your brother inside your heart. You'll never say it straight out. Because once you say it, for instance, say the person Baal to you, it's not chinam anymore. I've thought and thought and thought, and the only reason, the only reason, that there is sinas chinam is because of kina. I think it's the Maral I saw who says that kina is a maka shemli refuah. We're waiting for Mashiach to come. We have to get rid of him. Sinas chinam. Baruch Hashem, there's been tremendous shefa in the last few years. There's a lot of money. We don't know the Abishu's cheshben of why we got the coronavirus, but at least we can look at what we learned about ourselves from the coronavirus. 
We were able to survive Pesach without going to the Pesach program. I spoke to a few uh, Pesach uh, operators, and I heard numbers all over the place. But it caused the uh, Americans spend all across the world over $300 million on the Pesach program. And people deserve it. A woman works hard the whole year, schwitzing away in the kitchen. It's a vacation for her. And if you have the money, it's, and you like doing it, it's definitely something you should do. But only if you also give it stuck. People are spending tremendous amounts of money. And the Gemara says, we're entitled, if you have the money, to dira na, kalim na'im. You can have whatever you want for yourself. But as long as you realize that there's a whole group of our brothers in Eretz Yisrael in America, we can't make it to the end of the month. So when you go to your Pesach program or a safari or an island, Ashrecha, enjoy it. But keep in mind also, right before you go or maybe right after you come back, that you have to give them maybe not just as much, but considerable amounts of money. People said to me years ago that they believed when Renaissance C was Nifter, I hired the bar for Tzedakah. But the way I look at it is, clearly everybody had the money. They started giving it, but they had it. And I believe today it's the same thing. To be honest with you, when I go into Mir Yeshiva on one hand, I'm going to a place that I had the best years of my life. On the other hand, the mirror is the degel of all yeshivas. The amount we're giving them is ridiculously low. And we have the money. So first of all, I wanted to announce that we still have to work out the logistics, but in the near future, we're going to hire all the Yunga Light by 20%. I don't know why everybody's so happy. You guys are paying for it. (laughs) 
But I'll be honest with you, even with the 20%, Torah magno matzla, the Gemara says. Torah is what defends us. Even with the 20%, it's still not about covid and Asina. It just isn't. I don't know why we can't, on our own, decide and realize how important they are for us. That the last 70 years that went by without it, any of those tsars and crusades is because Tyre is flourishing all over. And Tyre is Megan. What's interesting is, there's a little trivia fact I looked up. Every soldier in the Israeli army gets 1,200 shekel a month. While a young man gets, I think it's approximately 900. And if you're a fighter, it can go up to 2,400 shekel a month. And who knows even our 900 shekel how long it's going to last. Why aren't we supporting our army? When I learned in yeshiva, every day I witnessed how Torah is Megan. There was no air conditioning then. We were all in just in one building. And the building was on Beis Yisrael, and obviously all the windows were open. It was a 120-second sprint to get right back into the Arab neighborhood. And I was thinking they're bombing Sparrow's Pizza for four or five people who like pizza, this place, that place. Beli al Tiftach Peh. They were right there. A thousand, over a thousand people. Right next to their neighborhood. We opened the windows for them. Are they blind? Did they not see it? And to be honest with you, in the beginning, I was scared. And I always looked at that as my personal riot that Torah is made, and I, I, didn't, I couldn't think of another answer. I don't know what I can say for people to actually give more money. I guess I'll actually say my I had with Reb Chaim Sechir Tzadik of Rachel. Where I went to him a few years ago and I said to him that what depresses me is, I actually like giving stuff. We say, we say Le Fun Sara Agra. Studies show that people who give are happier. How am I going to get tired for any of this? And it was something that really I was interested, interested in knowing. If it's something I like doing and I could do, what's the big deal? And what, why in the world would I get any schism from it? And Reb Chaim, 
he looked at his Gemara and he said, from learning. In other words, the Gishmak that he has in learning, you could ask the same Kasha. How's he going to get any exclusive? He loves learning. And I can't remember which Mishnah in Pirkei I think it was the Mishnah that we don't know the Schar for every mitzvah, but there's no question that if we accomplish the mitzvah, we'll definitely get Schar for it. I've said a few times over, because it's worked for me all the time. The Tatari says, Well, Sinasu is Hashem, you're not allowed to test the Abishtir. Except in one time. It says in Yermia. The Abishtir says, Test me. Not test me. No, please test me. Show me you give tzedakah. And what you give, you'll get 10 times that amount. If I have any mnemonis in this room, I could be made that I see it every week. The craziest things that I thought, something I thought was good is in Durard, and something that I thought in Durard makes me money. And it's always so close to the amount that you gave. I actually have three Talmidim. I'd like to have more, but me and Huni Hertz go way back when he was still a buffer. And when he was engaged, he expressed to me that he was somewhat nervous about Parnassia. And naturally, everybody is. So I said to him, but you know the Abishter's promise of the Chanuni Abizais. I remember it specifically because he made a joke, Uvechuni Abizais. That's that was he had a sense of humor then too. Yet he predict predictably answered me that he doesn't have extra money to give because he's going into a marriage and he has many expenses. I told him to borrow the money. He asked from where? I answered him from his chasna money. He immediately agreed with me and I witnessed he gave a sizable check to Tzedakah during one of the Shevardrachas. In, it was in Lake, in Lake, it was in Lake, it was in Lake. Like I said, I knew funny when he was a Bacher. And I know the Abishra could do my Ibsen. I don't know how much I believed that Davishter could make a person so wealthy. I don't give numbers if I'm not made them with my own eyes. And I know that stuff he gives is levels above what anybody in this room can imagine. And I'll tell you something. 
it's not hard for him to give because he sees it. And we kind of have a, a running joke that the nursing home business is bad, but we're not in the nursing home business. We're in the Luchanuni Nabizais business. And that's knocking out of the park. I give him a bracha that most of you don't know a lot of it stuff he gives because he gives it bits in a, but I give him a bracha because I know that his stuck increases every year, that he should keep growing and supporting yeshivas. And here's where you say amen. But I want more tell me that. Someone came over to me once and said, you know, I heard you speak. So I gave Staka, nothing happened. So well, let me ask you, how much did you give? It's $500. I said, you know, the Abishter gave Avram Avinu 10 this Now, I can understand that you don't want to put your son on the Mizbeach and Shechtim. But there's a big difference between that and $500. The Chanuni is a test, it's an assayin. An assayin is something you have to feel, it has to hurt. Because if it's not going to hurt, I can tell you now, don't bother. We all have kinna. I'll tell you one person why I'm a kinna. I was in a restaurant in New York called Luigi Siegel's. It closed years ago. And I can say that I have never been in any restaurant in New York, besides Kosher Delight, all of them, I've never entered any of them. First, well, I don't need to get into the, the restaurant uh, deal, but my proposal was, obviously I hope my wife would say yes. And I set up musicians and they were sitting there like customers, but one had a trumpet under the table, and the other one had a guitar, and the other one had a saxophone. And I said, if I give you a thumbs up, you get up and you start playing. Baruch Hashem, I don't know that I can't think Hashem enough. My wife did say yes, I gave the thumbs up, and all of a sudden they all got up and they started playing. Nine, 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 nine. It was, I thought it was better than she thought it was, but. She then pointed out to me in the back of the room a person sitting alone by the table. And she said to me, you know who that is? I said, who? That's my Schreifer. As a yeshiva buffer, I mean, every yeshiva buffer is his accountant, as they are mine and all of us. Everybody had a different idea of what he gave. But clearly, he, 
was levels above everybody in how much stuck that he gave. And there's one thing that you can never take away from him. In the Alta Heim, there were people who had money. But Kailam and Yeshivas weren't that popular to give money to. They knew how to say nobody home in Polish too. I'm Mekana Meishreifen because I can never take that from him. The schluss of changing the landscape, showing how important yeshivas and kailam are. I don't care if someone gives billions. That schluss still says with Moshe Reichel. So on his way out, he passed our table and he stopped and he said, Mazel Tov to me. And through my career, I've met them all business brokers, bankers, presidents. All the fine schmeckers, all the people who one would think, oh, if I could just meet him and shake his hand. And I've met those people. But I remember it like it was yesterday. When he said Mazel Tov to me, he looked me straight in the eye. And I knew he meant it. He wasn't saying words. And he smiled. And I can't tell you how majestic, how kingly, the feeling of royalty. that he had, that he showed. I don't know many other people, or personally, I don't know a lot of people altogether, but we all know there are a sheer I'm sure we give money. I felt those so literally like it was yesterday, just to shake his hand. It was literally like the king of the world, and not because he wanted it to be that way. And I remember his smile. And I said to my partnership and engagement, I hope one day this bracha will be mekuyim, and maybe I'll be able to give stuck. The amount of money that we see that gets spent, like I said, on Pesach programs, we live through it without going to the Pesach programs. Again, not that it's a bad thing if you have the money. 
As far as I know, all the Chazas that just had 10 people, they're still happily married. The hotels for Sukkis, we didn't go. I think everybody pretty much survived. And on and on and on. We learned that about ourselves. What we need and what we want. And I, I, I'm at a loss of words. Of what I could say to convince the island that Mir Yeshiva and other Yeshivas in Kailan, they're our army. We don't treat them that way. And I forgot about the 24,000 shekel they get once they leave. They all get 24,000 shekel towards tuition. I don't think anything that I say should matter if you can see it straight out in a pasuk. And it's Badek Lumenusa. And when things like that happen, I call people, you know, we usually tell them, can you imagine this? You know, I can't call everybody. But it, it's, it's almost so apparent that I just gave a check and I got back a lot of money. Again, I don't know if I have them on us by everybody or by anybody, but everybody should have this fuss to live nicely, to give nicely, to go on their vacations. Life is very stressful these days, and if a person has the money, let him go. But not without giving stuff. You don't go to a safari to see a gorilla who is more interested in seeing you than you're seeing him. And just forget about the 60% of children in Kiryat Sefer who are malnourished. Malnourished doesn't mean that they have flies around their face like from commercials. Malnourished means they're not getting the correct protein the correct ingredients. I think it's embarrassing. I'm embarrassed. I could start with one thing. by doing a match campaign. For $10 million. Don't worry about me, the money's coming back tenfold. I 
I'm not, as you can imagine, saying a speech. I'm making a bakasha. I'm making a bakasha from everybody. Let's treat them with dignity. Let's treat them right. They're just like us. They're our family. And how many of them can't make it to the end of the month? Why is this happening? There is so much money out there. And I know that from being in different businesses, not guessing. The numbers that people give, and I've heard tremendous numbers, are beautiful. And you can't, and you have to be very careful not to judge anybody because you don't know if they have money or not. So don't say, well, this guy's not giving money, but have you done his call Adam Lakafskus? You have to believe that he doesn't have the money before you start having tightness on him. But my bakash is for for everything that I've tried to help call Israel with. I don't get much back. So I'm asking, I want to call them some chips. I want people to leave tonight. Before they leave, whether you gave already or you didn't, I would tremendously appreciate it to everyone who gives another Nassim. And don't worry about it. It's coming back. Like I said, it's Badakum Anusa. Because they talk about a person who went, who died, He's a very wealthy man. He was worth over a billion dollars. And he said, well, how much money does it cost to get into get, uh, Ghanaian? He said, oh, that's $150,000. So he takes out his checkbook and he writes 100. And he says, over here, we only accept checks that were already processed. We're always looking at our cash flow here in, in this world. Do we know how much money we have in Shemayim? Because we do. It's If people believed that this is the case, in Shemayim, there is money. American dollars. They would obviously write their will in a different way. I assume something like giving 50% to themselves because they're going to need it. And then 50% for the rest of the family. It's not theoretical. You're not taking anything. I haven't seen 
تخریخ میاد بود پاکتس Let's be a little selfish and fill up our own bank accounts. Because once you're there, it's over. And everybody goes there eventually. I'm sorry for taking up so much of everybody's time. I thought it was very unnecessary for them to honor me when they have someone with one of the largest companies, lending companies in New York. going night after night after night. For who? Not for him, not for his kids. I'm the kind of this listen that Ralph Hertz has. So I'd like to leave everybody with a bracha. That we should all see Shefa in our lives. And we will. We will see it. As, as long as Like there's a Rashi that says, Muspalbat haver hunenet tchila. First take care of those people. They need it so bad. I'm involved in Pesach programs. I'm embarrassed. I want to again finish with the question as a, literally a personal favor I'm asking. And I never like asking. I feel very uncomfortable. But I'm asking everyone to take this dinner and the point of this dinner very seriously. And when you leave, and you go to your neighborhoods, tell those people to do it too. Tell them to start filling up their real bank accounts. So I give Rafa that there should be Shefa. And I give a Rafa to the Rish Hayeshiva. Not that he should have enough money to make Chalukas, but he should have enough money to let people live like a mensch. How, how do you spend money knowing that as you spend money, another Yid, a whole family of Yid, are malnourished? It's embarrassing.
אם ירצה השם, I give a bracha. Someone actually, I never mentioned this, no, I, I, did, I actually did once, but it, someone said to me, I went to a certain gadol near Tisrael, and I asked him for a bracha for money. It's, you don't ask me. It's, why not? He said, I'm not shilet on the, on the mazel of money. Tyra, we could talk about that, but if you want a bracha to get mazel in your business, get a bracha from someone who you know is a real usher. And ever since then I've done it, I had to switch once because the person was nifter. I do it between Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. But however you, however you do it, I would love to see, because I know there's people in this room that a lack of money causes shown bias problems. It's not a good feeling. I'd like to speak by a dinner like this next year where everyone, everyone has the money, not ad balidai necessarily, But they're not, I think the term they use in California for the homeless is food insecurity. Not knowing where you're going to get your next meal. So I hope to be standing by a dinner where everybody has the money and everybody's happy that everybody has the money. When, when, when Asa thought he was getting a bracha from his father Yaakov, I'm sorry, his father Yitzhak. And he comes back and he says, Can I have my bracha? Give me a bracha too. I'm the Bukhar. And Yitzhak said, I already gave the bracha. So every yeshiva boy will ask, is there really a lack of brachas? Why didn't he him, give him brachas for showing bias for good kids? There's a million things that he could have given a bracha for. And I heard someone said, Pshat, that Esau didn't stop one of bracha. Esau said he wanted the, the habracha achas he wanted the bracha of achas, of one, of unity, of achtos, because he knew that if Yaakov Avinu has achtos, real achtos, we wouldn't have to worry about getting hurt physically, and we wouldn't have to worry about the Yitzhahara being shayled on us. Thank you for listening.